Sure. Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse is one of the most interesting films to enter the Oscar race in a long time. I'm Zach Laws of Gold Derby, and with me now is that film cinematographer, Jaron Blaschke. Uh, and let me ask you something. Um, this is uh, the kind of film that you would think would be a cinematographer's nightmare in that, you know, it features two characters more or less in the same set for two hours. And yet, you know, it's also very strikingly visual. So what did you think the first time that you read the script for this movie? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a simple for stream because there's so much imagery in there. Um, and it's black and white. And uh, I get to shoot in a, in a ratio that I probably will not be able to again. Um, so uh, that's always great. And it's a Rob movie. And I know that I can go out there with it, uh, with him. Um, and just, you know, we, we push ourselves. So um, joyous to get it. Um, so yeah, as far as the confinement, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I got the script. It's very theatrical. So we, we try to embrace that. Um, a lot of it, you just don't really, you can't really uh, envision until you've seen uh, the actors do it, even in a sort of 10% level, uh, rehearsal level. Um, but yeah, that, I guess that was the challenge, just trying to uh, elevate um, the dialogue uh, scenes or, or not, you know, or, or just be simple about it. Uh, we're not people who, um, you know, even if it's shot, reverse shot, we don't feel the need to uh, put three angles in each direction, you know, that's simple, you know, just know what, what the beat changes are uh, in these dialogue scenes. And then that's how you, that's how you build the, the structure. You mentioned the uh, aspect ratio and uh, certainly one of the more uh, interesting things about this movie is that it's shot in such a way that makes it look like, uh, uh, you know, uh, silent films or, you know, films from the twenties and thirties um, also shot in black and white, of course. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, this, the decision behind shooting the film that way, uh, what was the reason behind it? Yeah, I think it's, I think it, it's, uh, very unusual for people. I mean, obviously it's, it's, uh, unusual at this day and age to have something in this aspect ratio. Um, but, uh, at least for Rob's sensibilities, his go-to normal for him is, is kind of one, three, three. So it's just a little bit tighter than, than how we kind of sees things anyway. I mean, our, our shorts, uh, our two shorts together were, one three three and uh the witch was you know that's like that's his version of cinema scope as we go to one six six so um it didn't feel that off to us uh i mean a confined space you know obviously felt like one three three and you know this is that's what we're gonna do and um i don't know where i first even heard of one one nine i'm not i'm certainly not a film history aficionado but uh you know i heard about it i was like you know maybe Maybe this would be like one opportunity we could do this, which is a, you know, it's a, a five by six ratio, which actually is pretty close to, it's somewhere between one, three, three, and then uh, like eight by 10 uh, photography, uh, you know, that ratio. So, yeah, which, which, I, which I also do. So I'm pretty comfortable with it. I've also shot with a hospital, which is square a lot. So, um, you know, I, I know that it can uh, frame a person in an environment well, let alone a, a confined environment. So I was pretty comfortable with that. Well, it certainly helps with this uh, sense of confinement, as you talked about. Uh, can you talk about some of the visual ways that you uh, express that confinement, not just obviously with aspect ratio, but, you know, choice of lenses, choice of angles, things like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the environment, um, I mean, it wasn't that huge of a set. Uh, I mean, you always shrink things down or, or try to expand them as best you can. Um, I mean, the environment kind of did it. On its own, I mean, with a in one one nine, you have a wide shot. You're seeing the ceiling, so even that kind of crops in, and and uh, the, the the I don't know if I can call it a garret. I don't know if I need Rob here to uh, for my architecture terms, but uh, the upstairs, um, uh, you know, kind of falls in in shape, uh, you know. And uh, Craig was the production designer was very helpful in, in kind of shaping things to our our frame to an extent. So um, and also just the 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 night. What I think also helps this confinement, uh, this confining feeling, is that the uh, the night interiors are just a, a lamp and stuff just falls off to black, which our film stock does very rapidly. So uh, sometimes you just have a you know a lamp, two men, and it just falls off. So it, it even feels even smaller within this small frame. So, um, so that's interesting uh, as well. Uh, other than that, I think it's just um, yeah, I, I think it's really just the shape. Um, and and the, the environment that does you know ninety percent of the, the heavy lifting. So because um, the camera certainly moves in places, but we try to do it in a um, 
in a way that uh, almost I don't know. Like, I, it's hard to explain. <laughs> right. Um, um, shooting in black and white. Now, was that something that you had done before at all uh, on this uh, level? Yeah, I, sh- I mean, I don't think I've shot a black. I shot. I've shot like two black and white shorts ever. Mm-hmm. Um, I do a lot of black and white photography that no one's ever seen. But I'm doing that for 25 years. Uh, I should. I should show people um, that I have, you know, 17 binders and negatives, uh, mostly in black and white. So, you know, tonally, I, you know, uh, I've had a practice uh, in that realm. I mean, not not a narrative sense, but you know, shot structure is is, is shot structure. Um, so that. Yeah, it's mostly still photography, and and uh, I think last time I shot double X was two thousand five. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll talk a little bit about the ways in which shooting in black and white uh, is different from color. I mean, because it's it's obviously not just uh, the fact that you're shooting in black and white. I mean, there's uh, there's different uh, things you have to do in terms of lighting and uh, and uh, and things like that. So, can you talk about some of the challenges of shooting in black and white? Um, yeah, I don't know if they treat that. Uh, treat that differently because um, I think when I shoot in color, I, it doesn't doesn't tend to be a lot of uh, color variation variation anyway. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, light, I, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but uh, I tend to like harder light, in black and white, and color. I like to be softer. I don't know if that's just um, the contrast plus the color is just like too much for my brain. Or but uh, in black and white, I can really just do like a you know tiny little bulb and you know, really hard shadows. Um, I don't know if there's anything, at least in my consciousness, that's, uh, you know, that I, that I would do, dif- you know, much more, much differently than that. Right. Was there a uh, scene in this film that was particularly difficult uh, to shoot, uh, either from a technical standpoint or from a standpoint of, uh, uh, you know, like how to best visually represent this moment? Um. There's plenty of that stuff. Uh, what popped in my head, I guess, first was um, perhaps anything at the boathouse where you had to look back at the shore, so the camera's over the water. Uh, you know, there's no handheld photography in this movie. Um, so to get the camera over the water and look back, uh, that means there's a drink sequence early on, and there's the whole dramatic uh, dip of the axe. It's just, you know, it's trying to launch a boat, and there's a storm. Uh, so getting the camera over the water and, uh, you know, on a solid, uh, mount, uh, and, and a bit over the water, uh, was, was challenging. All that stuff where, you know, the, where we had to do that was, um, shot a few different occasions just due to tides because pretty soon you're not over the water anymore. So, um, yeah, I think the dream sequence was shot. I, I would have to count, I'd have to tally it off, but it's at least four different, uh, times, you know, including, uh, you know. VFX elements uh, portion as well. So, um, and then, and also the other time with the, with the, um, launching the boat during the storm and Willem uh, in the background was, um, uh, I think our, our rain effect was breaking down constantly and uh, went through like four or five of them. Um, and also uh, it was just the, the housing was, was fogging up and because it's video tap, it's not, you know, a digital shot. So the, um, you know, you're trying to interpret whether it's fogged up and you, go to the camera after a take and you see it's full of fog, but you don't know if it's heavy enough to ruin it or not. So, um, yeah, just doing that over and over again was uh, frustrating. And were there specific visual references that you looked at, be it uh, other movies or photographs or things like that? Uh, Were there visual references you looked at uh, to sort of uh, prepare yourself for this movie? Yeah, I, uh, Rob sent me, um, I, I think I've exaggerated before sending, telling, you know, saying he sent me like 50 movies, but he probably sent me you know, 20, 20 something, 30. Um, and that's hard, you know, uh, and it was probably two weeks before seeing him. So, you know, I see what I can, I have a daughter, you know, uh, there's other stuff going on. So, um, but, you know, I'll get to seven, you know, and then the rest, <laughs> he'll, he'll curate, you know, while we're there uh, in Halifax. Um, but um, yeah, there's all the really silent stuff. I'm trying to figure out what to extract from that. There's sort of some orthochromatic um, looking stuff in there, which I'm already I was already sort of aware of. Um, you know, like kind of faux documentaries from the 20s, even. Um, but for me, I guess uh, what kind of changed the thing that was made the most overt difference to my thinking uh, among a lot of other stuff uh, was uh, just seeing Fritz Lang's M. Um, because it's just a modern film. I mean, I think at least I was imagining it um, 
you know, from an early, uh, from an early point, just, you know, it's 1890s. It, it, it will look like, uh, you know, uh, emulsion on glass plate and it'll be, you know, this, um, very, um, 19th century, like hard look, uh, camera, you know, not doing much. Um, and then I just saw this mo movie, uh, M, I just saw it for the aspect ratio, no other reason, just see some compositions and, you know, but it's just such a modern movie, but at the same, you know, as far as the camera movements, um, and what he was doing, you know, the, the juxtaposition of, of sound and, you know, image and what you don't show, which to me is always kind of the most important thing, actually, more than what you do. Um, anyway, just kind of, I connected to the movie a lot. So it's like, oh, I can kind of do my own thing, but as long as there's this similar tone of how the camera moves um, and it, it'll feel, you know, it won't feel like 19th century, but that's, that's fine. It'll be much more complex. Uh, we can still make a modern movie that, but still takes you to the past. Um, so that was kind of encouraging. And I just sort of, uh, you know, I, I allowed myself to, you know, just open up the rules a little bit for, for myself. I definitely saw some of that German expressionist uh, influence, you know, in, in like the way that the film is lit and things like that. So it's not surprising that uh, a Fritz Lang movie would be uh, one of your bigger influences there. Yeah, um, camera than, uh, than lighting, really, because, you know, I think lighting, I mean, I, I, for me, it's like very modern lighting, in a, you know, but the texture and, the, and everything else is, is uh, antiquated. So um, I didn't come up with the craft that they did, you know, shooting with a slow film stock with, with hard lights on a, you know, on a grid, uh, you know, four movies a year. Uh, it's just not what the industry is right now. So, um, I inevitably go to my, you know, light things similar the way that I normally do. Um, but, uh, but there's, you know, but within these, but throwing in, you know, this sort of antiquated, um, whatever that is into the mix. Mm -hmm. You've worked with uh, Robert Egger several times before, as you mentioned, uh, including on The Witch. Um, what's that collaboration like? Um, well, yeah, it's it's extremely comfortable. Um, it's, uh, you know, we can kind of poke fun at each other. Uh, we did our first interview together yesterday, which is kind of fun, but uh, he, he got really comfortable and, you know, <laughs> um, maybe a little too comfortable, but um, just calling each other names or whatever. But, uh, you know. Um, we just know each other really well, and, and uh, I know that if, if I have an idea, um, I'm not afraid to express it because, uh, you know, he's as weird as me. So uh, if there's something that's, um, I'll just throw anything in front of him, in front of him. Um, and a lot, you know, it's rare that uh, it doesn't work for both of us, you know. And if he comes up with something, it's like, hey, you know, I think we could do this a little uh better he's you know totally open to it and and um so i yeah it's, i don't want to say it's like this mind meld thing but it's it our tastes are shockingly similar and i felt that way from the uh, from the beginning on the you know our first short film together um so it just makes it incredibly easy it's just you know dumb chance that uh you know i found someone that reacts to this uh you know that has such similar taste and and uh is excited about the same things visually well, you know, the interesting thing about his background is that, you know, he was a production designer before moving into directing. So, I mean, does it help to work with somebody who has that kind of technical knowledge of, of the um, craft? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're both kind of in the same, like, indie drag New York, uh, you know, couch surfing thing. Uh, right. I was for a little too long, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, because I'm, I'm very particular uh, and, uh, you know, um, so to find someone, you know, like him who uh, would not compromise within that environment was, uh, I don't know, it, it's still kind of astounding. But I guess I, I stuck around long enough to, uh, to find him, perhaps. Um, but as far as the practice design background, um, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's stuff that he designed. Like, I got him in on a couple short films I was doing, you know, uh, a couple different times. And, and you know, uh, I have this memory of sort of um, trying to pitch, like, uh, the pacing of a, of a certain like you know crane shot going up the stairs uh, to this director and they were perplexed you know and, and Rob was like yes and he's like oh you know and then he, he like he went away you know because like we just again it was just like this weird thing where it just we had the same taste you know? um so yeah we kind of had the secret bond that we had to, <laughs> to play down while I'm, like, cheating on these other directors basically you know but yeah um yeah 
Well, it's certainly one of the most fascinating movies of the year, and uh, 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 nothing else, I mean, one of the best shot. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on your work. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Here. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, and thanks to all you at home for watching. Make sure you hit the uh, like and subscribe button below. Make sure you visit us at goldderby.com for all the latest Oscar news.